lightning snakes are very cool. They can do many things with very little body to work with. Despite not having a single leg, they have evolved into species that can swim, climb trees, glide between trees, and even reach speeds of 18 miles per hour. And I have a snake. And I also have a snake tattoo. What can I say? I like them. Which means we've come to the second episode of my tattoo series. This is Snake Edition. We'll be using it to explore the evolution of snakes, some of the unbelievable adaptations that they have today, and to answer the burning question, where did their legs go? Also, look at my shirt. It says, damn, I love frogs. Okay, let me show you the tattoo. So I got this tattoo about a year and a half ago, and it's not a specific species, it's just a generic snake. The sternum was rough, to say the least, and I was not looking for specific species features. I just wanted a quick, generic snake. This is actually a matching tattoo I have with my sister, Presley, because we both like snakes. We had two corn snakes growing up. I named mine Micro, because he was very small, and she named hers Susan. We got these done by another artist at Third Street Tattoo named Nolan Voigt. His work is absolutely sick. He actually did another animal tattoo of mine that I'll be showing you later on in the series. And you can check out more of his work at his Instagram right here. And now that I've shown you my generic snake tattoo, let's get the generic snake information out of the way. Snakes are, of course, reptiles in the class Reptilia. Mammals in class Mammalia. Reptiles in class Reptilia. It's easy to remember. And like other reptiles, snakes are ectotherms, or cold-blooded, meaning they get their body heat from the external environment. Humans, other mammals, and birds are all endotherms, or warm-blooded, because we produce our own body heat internally and use energy to keep it at a constant rate, regardless of what the external temperature is. For example, we shiver when it's cold and sweat when it's hot. Snakes don't do that. If it's hot, they go under a rock or inside of a crevice. That's why pet snakes need a hot side and a cold side of their tank, like my snake, Valentino has a heat map. I'm gonna show you him at the end of the video. Hopefully I don't have issues getting him out because uh, he's supposed to be fed tomorrow, so he might be a little feisty, so we'll see. So because of this, snakes and other reptiles are a bit limited in where they can live. They can't be too cold, which is why most snakes are found in desert and tropical regions. And then the poles are a definite no-go zone. Their little bodies would turn into little popsicles, snocksicles, if you will. Despite these environmental limitations, snakes have diversified into some impressive forms. There are about 3,500 species of snakes alive today, some with outrageously potent venom, others large enough to constrict and on rare occasion kill a human, and some that look like little worms. And I think in order to understand the diversity of these snake capabilities, we must first understand where they came from and how they came to be. Lizards. Snakes evolved from lizards, which is probably not surprising at all. A snake looks like a legless lizard, but as you might know from my snake evolution skit I uploaded a while ago, you do look pretty cool, I'm not gonna lie. Maybe I'll become a snake too. You can't just become a snake. Why not? I'll just lose the legs. Then you're just a legless lizard. What? Legless lizards are a whole other thing. And then there's Sicilians, which are legless amphibians, the OGs, all different categories of land animals that completely lost their limbs, never to be seen again, that we know of. Anyway, a snake is not just a legless lizard. They are much more than that because they underwent other major adaptations to become the snake, like changes Shit, that's gonna be done <laughs> in a couple weeks. Like changes in their skull to create an extremely flexible mouth to open super wide to swallow prey whole. That's an adaptation that immediately makes sense, right? Keywords immediately make sense. I would argue that our topic today, losing legs to evolutionary time, does not immediately make sense as a beneficial adaptation to live on for millions and millions of years. Like, why the fuck did that happen? Well, lucky for us, there are a few hypotheses that make this occurrence make sense. Specifically two major ones. The first one, adapting to a life in the water. This is supported by their eel, eel, eel. Eel. This is supported by their eel-like undulations, those side-to-side -side movements they use on both land and in the water. The second one, and my personal favorite, adapting to a life underground, being able to slither in the burrows where the meat tastes the best. Having a long, slender body is very beneficial for going headfirst into the dirt all the time. And limb reduction tends to be a general trend among other headfirst burrowing animals. This is the hypothesis I fuck with, and also the debate is kind of leaning in this direction as of right now. Unfortunately, the fossil record does not really favor long and slender species with delicate bones, so there's a lot about snake evolution that still remains a mystery. However, we do know for sure that all of the legs didn't get smaller and smaller at the same time over millions of years until they completely disappeared. It actually seems to have happened in two phases. First, their front limbs became reduced and lost. And then their hind limbs became reduced and lost rather than all four limbs reduced and lost at once. So let's give a round of applause to the fossil record because scientists have discovered some incredibly well-preserved fossils of these transitional species that only had hind limbs. Koya, can you play with your toy in the other room? I know, it's such a fun toy. Go get it. 
<clears throat> Allow me to introduce you to a few of them. Some of the earliest fossil remains of snakes come from the Jurassic, sometime between 167 and 143 million years ago. One of these is Eophis, whose name means the dawn snake, as this is one of the oldest snakes ever found. As far as I know, only skull remains have been found of Eophis, but scientists suspect that they probably still had four legs. Because snakes, like I kind of mentioned before, are not identified by their lack of legs. The skull is what makes a snake a snake, those adaptations that allow them to unhinge their jaw and swallow their food whole. That's <laughs> so stupid. So it seems as though the ancestors to snakes, first of all, to be able to do this, and then lost their forelimbs and then their hind limbs. And as far as the office goes, I don't believe any artist reconstructions have been made. So here's a different one of Portugalophis. 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 Wait for it. Portugalophis. Portugalophis. Keep waiting. I'm gonna guess it's Portugalophis, a snake from 152 million years ago, found in, you guessed it, Portugal. They had four teeny little legs. And another snake alive during that time, Diablophis, found in Colorado. They also had four teeny tiny little legs. And Eophis was found in England, by the way. Moving on to the two-legged snakes. By about 130 million years ago, it seems as though the forelimbs had been lost and they were left with hind legs. Allow me to introduce you to Pachyrachis, a marine snake alive during this time in what is now the West Bank. They had the teeny tiny little hind limbs and their name means thick spine because they had thickened vertebrae and thickened ribs. Adaptations that are associated with increased buoyancy in the water, which allowed scientists to speculate that they probably spent their life in the water. And Najesh, alive about 95 million years ago, much later, they still had just the little teeny tiny hind limbs. That lived on for a long time. They were first discovered in Argentina in 2006 with very fragmented remains. So scientists knew they existed, but not much more than that. But in 2019, scientists hit the fucking jackpot and found eight skulls of Najesh, including specimens that were nearly perfectly preserved three-dimensional Scientists were able to take CT scans of it and gain new insight on how the skulls specifically shifted through the transition from lizard to snake. So shit was chugging along, right? Over millions of years, the snakes had become more and more snake-like. So what happened next? Well, interestingly, the lineage that led to pythons and boas diverged before hind limbs were completely lost about 70 million years ago. And those tiny little hind limb nubs held on for dear life. And to this day, boa constrictors and pythons are born with little hind legs inside of their body. Okay, so we've got a range of different leg configurations of the overall snake lineage, right? We've got four legs, hind limbs only, and even teeny tiny little nubby hind legs inside of the body. A nice variety mix to show a nice smooth progression from lizard to linguini. We have now arrived to the part of the video where I was gonna go in depth on the genetic aspects of snake evolution. As I had previously mentioned, the research for this video was taking so long because I was dedicating a lot of it to understanding the genetic side of things. But I actually found that when I placed it into the rest of the information for this video, it was really bulky and didn't really fit anywhere. Maybe because that's not really my thing. Like I, it's hard for me to understand. So it kind of came off as like a freshman year genetics class presentation that somebody got a C minus on. So I decided to simplify it and throw it in here because although genetics is not my strong suit, there's a gene involved in this process that I think you will like the sonic hedgehog gene responsible for limb development so in lizards let's say the sonic hedgehog gene drives the process well hmm 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 do i hmm do I want to draw it? No, I don't want to draw it. Never mind. The sonic hedgehog gene drives the process of leg growth as the embryo is developing. Think of it like a light switch. So it turns on and stays on as the limb is developing all the way until it's finished. In pythons, boas, and other snakes, a series of mutations led the sonic hedgehog light switch to be extremely weak. In pythons and boas, it just kind of flickers on and off really quick. So they get a little bit of something, a little rudiments inside of their body. And then in other snakes, it really just doesn't turn on at all. That's it. That's the sonic hedgehog gene. Okay, so back to the prehistoric shit. As we know, about 66 million years ago, just a few millions of years after the pythons and boas diverged, an asteroid slammed into the Gulf of Mexico, or what is now the Gulf of Mexico, and ultimately led to the extinction of all the non avian dinosaurs, along with 75% of life on Earth. That is a topic for another day. But snakes survived this mass extinction. And in the millions of years following, while life was still developing to fill the unoccupied niches that was left by the apocalypse, snakes stepped the fuck up and gave rise to the largest predator on the planet following the extinction of the dinosaurs that we know of. Titanoboa, who was the largest snake ever discovered. They could get to nearly 50 feet long, about the length of a semi-truck trailer, and three feet thick. They were so wide, they would have a hard time squeezing through your bedroom door if they were alive today. And if one slithered past you right now, it would come up to your waist. That's 
not gonna work, but never mind. So it would come up to your waist while completely flat on the ground. That is a big ass, thick ass snake. And the reason they were able to get this big is because of how their body works as ectotherms, which like I said earlier, means they get their body heat from the external environment, which ultimately impacts how their metabolism works. So with snakes, generally the warmer it is, the bigger they can get, which is why today the larger snakes are found in the warmer climates. And back then, following the extinction 60 million years ago, their environment was much warmer than it is today. Quick sidebar. There's a general trend on the internet where somebody will ask why animals were so big millions of years ago, and someone will follow up with oxygen being the only answer. That oxygen concentrations were higher in the past, which allowed animals to be big. That is not the case. As we have explored on this channel already, there are enormous differences in how different animals function, how their bodies function, which means that different factors impact the size of different groups. There's no blanket statement that you can make across the board for all animal groups with really anything, except for the fact that they need water and oxygen and to consume. Anyway, the only time oxygen applied to the size of animals was arthropods with very specific respiratory systems during the Carboniferous period about 300 million years ago. Conversation for whenever I cover the Carboniferous period, which is definitely gonna come this year. So. Anyway, snakes are generally larger in warmer climates, all other factors aside. This seems to be why Titanoboa was a tank and could have easily seen you as a snake. They're actually a featured page in my Spooky Specimens coloring book that I made myself that you can get on Amazon if you like to learn about spooky creatures and color at the same time. Another large snake that I will introduce you to is Paleophis colossius, an at least semi-aquatic species that was alive during the Paleogene period about 50 million years ago. Paleophis, named after Paleogene and Colossius because they were colossal. By measuring their fossilized vertebrae and comparing it in a ratio with body length measurements to living snakes, scientists were able to estimate that these snakes could have been 26 to 40 feet long. Their fossils have been found in what would have been near shore marine environments. So they might have spent time on land and in water or maybe completely in the water. Regardless, it was a big ass water snake. And many people don't realize that sea snakes are still a thing. They still exist. I always forget about sea snakes for some reason. I don't know. It's like my brain refuses to accept them. So all snakes can swim swim to at least some degree using the same motions that they use on land to propel themselves through the water. But then sea snakes also exist separately. They have vertically flattened bodies, kind of like eels that work as a paddle to go through the ocean. The same kind of side to side undulations as fish. Some can get to nearly nine feet long and most, if not all, are venomous. Because they are air breathing animals that transitioned back to the water, they're restricted to coastal waters because they can't be super deep in the ocean. But at least one species, the blue banded sea snake, has these structures that almost resemble gills on the top of their head and pretty much function like gills and allow them to take in oxygen from the water. And other sea snakes can absorb some amount of oxygen through their skin. So they have been evolutionary Evolutionarily going hard. And how about some of those uh, flying snakes? <laughs> And how about some of those flying snakes? Well, technically gliding. Yes, there are five species of snakes that can glide through the air. They spread out and flatten their ribs to act like a parachute as they launch themselves off of a branch and into the rainforest canopy, doing those side to side undulations that they always do. That allows them to glide distances of up to 300 feet. Dude, imagine not having arms or legs and throwing yourself across the jungle and catching yourself on a branch with precision as a frequent means of transportation. That is sick. And the climbing that they do is really sick too because they don't necessarily continuously wrap their body around a tree trunk like you would probably imagine they're going up a tree. Some species do that, but others will rely on their muscles to grab onto small ridges in the trunk and kind of pull themselves upwards, putting most of their weight in one specific section. There's a study from about 10 years ago where scientists made these fake tree trunks and put sensors all over them to record how different species made their way up a tree, how much force they applied and all that. All the snakes in the study used much more force and thus energy than they needed to get themselves up the tree, which to me, tells me that they're just mentally panicking as they're trying to get up the fucking tree. Like, fuck, shit, fuck, which <laughs> I, I, I think is very funny. And a method of transportation one species in particular is known for is sidewinding by the sidewinder found in the Southwest United States. They essentially figured out how to run, okay? They're pretty much running. By having only two parts of their body on the floor at the same time, they essentially push off and propel themselves forward and can reach 18 miles per hour doing so, making them the fastest snake that we know of. And how about the smallest snake that we know of? This, the Barbados thread snake. At their largest, they are four inches long and weigh 0.6 grams, 0.6 grams. They're only found in the forests of Eastern Barbados and because they're so small, very little is known about them. They are usually mistaken for worms. We don't know much, but due to their size, science has hypothesized they must only really eat insect larvae because what else could they eat? And they're only big enough to lay one egg at a time, which is really cute. Uh, let me go try and introduce you to Tino. This is Tino. He's not, I don't think he's really having it right now, to be honest. Um, He is a corn snake. Yeah, he's, he's not. I'm. Uh, okay, I think he's a little bit stressed out and I'll explain why. Koya 
is a fucking menace. And every time I try and take him out to socialize him, she is all over the place and I get really stressed out, <laughs> to be honest, because I don't want her to hurt him. And so I haven't been socializing him as much as I should, but let's see if he can just chill out here for a second. I've had Tino for about two years now. I got him when he was a very tiny baby and he's gotten much bigger. He's just a cute little guy. I got him um, on Valentine's day, which is why he's named Valentino. And he has a pretty cool tank setup. Maybe he can just chill out here. Okay, buddy. Before I go, I wanna mention a couple things that I started to talk about in the bug eating video, but I was too overwhelmed to remember exactly what I wanted to say. I'm moving, it's not a big move. I'm just moving into the city closer to my friends cause right now I'm pretty far away near the beach, which means I'm gonna be redecorating. This is gonna be different and I'm very excited to do so. As we know, I love redecorating. So I'm really excited to mess around with it and add stuff that I've been wanting to add that I just don't have space for. I have this really sick electric bass guitar that my sister let me have that she used to use when we were in a band in high school. So I wanna add that to the mix cause it's really sick. And I'm planning to publish Patreon sometime after that maybe early or mid April. I'm gonna do multiple tiers and offer stuff like live streams, early access to videos, polls and suggestions for upcoming videos and little community chats. So if you're interested, that is coming up soon as well. Oh, you wanna check out the mic. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next long form video, which is another episode of the What the Fuck Is That series. And you can keep up with my daily short form content on TikTok and Instagram. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See y'all. And now that I've shown you my generic snake tattoo, let's get the generic snake information out of the way. Let me do that again. <laughs> okay.